Hello and welcome to the New Paradigm Health Podcast. My name is John Morimutu. In today's edition, I'll be talking about one disease, one solution. How to add years to your life and life to your years. Most people think that we have a chronic disease guarantee that will fall uh, foul to various diseases in our old age. Autoimmunity, arthritis, stroke, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, depression, dementia, those kind of things that are so familiar to us. I'll argue it doesn't have to be like that. And in the course of this presentation, I'll be talking about why we're living longer, sicker lives, the causes of most chronic diseases, the British average diet or the bad, and resilience and how to cultivate it. Please note, the information presented here is based on professional training, personal experience and interpretation of information from medical journals, articles or books, and it's for informational and educational purposes only. It's not an attempt to diagnose and prescribe. People are advised to contact their primary or specialist health professional before making medical, nutritional, lifestyle or any other health related changes. When I give this presentation live, I always ask this question. Do you or your nearest and dearest have any of these or other chronic health conditions? And here's a long list. It's certainly not a comprehensive list. There are many, many more chronic conditions than that. But always hands shoot up pretty much straight away. Um, because we're surrounded by chronic diseases. We either have them ourselves or we know people who do. And they're usually people that we know quite well. And then there's whole bunches of people who have chronic conditions that we're not aware of that we don't know so well. So it, it's, it's ubiquitous. So I love to quote Hippocrates, the Greek physician often referred to as the father of medicine. And he said, before you heal someone, ask him if he's willing to give up the things that made him sick. This really puts the people front and center in having their own personal responsibility for the health issues. And it leads to a second question. What did make you sick in the first place? So that's where uh, myself and Julie started up New Paradigm Health really got passionate about this issue to get to the root causes of why people are sick and help them address these factors essentially acting as detectives and that's really the functional medicine or root cause medicine approach another great greek thinker philosopher was plato and i think he makes a very very important point when it comes to health and says the greatest mistake that physicians make is that they attempt to cure the body without attempting to cure the mind yet the mind and body are one and should not be treated separately I love this quote from Plato and unfortunately it's more, probably more appropriate now, more apposite now than it's ever been because people really separate their body and mind and, and treat their body as sometimes nothing more than a means of carrying their heads from place to place. Um, this is especially true amongst those who essentially live in their heads, the more intellectual among us, who treat their body as a kind of appendage. And we've specialised and specialised and specialised and often with great results because of this specialisation. but there tends to be trend of thinking of things as separate, that even the organ systems which all interact are treated as being separate entities. This is part of the process of reductionism, which has uh, allowed us to make great breakthroughs because we've been able to specialize and isolate things, but we haven't necessarily put them back into the context of the whole in which they work, which is the opposite of reductionism, which is holism. And we need both. We need both reductionism and we need holism. So let's look at the rise of chronic disease. And I've talked about these ideas of lifespan, how long you live, and health span, how long you live healthily. People um, are often asked, would they like to live a long life? And people say, no, I wouldn't. And you probe a little bit further and ask, well, why, why is that? Why wouldn't you like to live a long life? Well, I say, well, I don't want to live in chronic ill health. I don't want to live in disease. I don't want to lose my mind. Um, I don't want to lose my physical faculties. But if you said, well, you could live healthy for that time, you could have a life, long lifespan, a long health span, then people would often change their mind and say, yeah, I'd love to live to 110 if I could live healthy to 110. So to illustrate lifespan, we have lifespan, life expectancy at birth, this graph of England and Wales from 1841 to 2012. And here's the line for women, and it goes up pretty steadily up to the present day and it's continuing to rise to this very day although the curve is somewhat flattening now and here's the equivalent for men again there's a rise but um, as you can see uh, never catches up it always goes in parallel to women which reflects the fact that men live uh, on average shorter lives than women by about four or five years on average 
this graph it exemplifies the increase in lifespan uh, relatively spectacular increase in lifespan in industrialized countries and that's been uh, rolled out throughout the world and a number of interlinked lifestyle changes have contributed to this success story however to reverse that old familiar saying every silver lining has a cloud and just because some a little of something is good doesn't mean that more is necessarily better so many of the very positive processes that have ushered in these longevity gains have also had their flip side one of the major breakthroughs has been improved sanitation. It's been a lifesaver and it has allowed people to live much longer lives and so some of the diseases which were chronic um, in the 18th, 19th century have been eliminated pretty much in the 20th century in most Western countries. But it can sometimes be overdone and so you get practices such as obsessive use of antibacterial cleaning products, for example, which contribute to a depletion of beneficial microbes and beneficial microbes are very, very important for overall health. There's been a real breakthrough in recent years in study of what's called the human microbiome, um, which has shown the importance of these microbes to our health. So most microbes are actually good for us, um, unlike the stereotypical image of a microbe being something that destroys your health. There's been a dramatic reduction in deficiency disease such as scurvy which is caused by deficiency of vitamin C, rickets caused by a lack of vitamin D, pellagra caused by a lack of vitamin B3, beriberi caused by a lack of vitamin B1. But diseases of insufficiency have now been given, given way to diseases of overabundance so people are eating just too much and sometimes also the wrong foods which we'll talk about a bit later. Antibiotics have been a major medical game changer and you can see that blip, um, the increase in survivorship, increase in longevity from about 1913 to 1950s and that coincides with the era of antibiotics. And that's despite the Second World War being part of that period so there still was an increase in lifespan. And they've really changed the game medically with previously fatal diseases rendered harmless and many surgical procedures transformed from a life or death thing, matter of life or death to something that's a fairly routine process. The antibiotics have been chronically overused for both humans and for livestock, leading to a crisis of antibiotic resistance. And the depletion of the body's beneficial microbes, and that's had massively detrimental impacts. And um, many concerned commentators are considering the fact that we might be moving into a post-antibiotic era when that would have devastating consequences. So you might be asking the question, why do women live longer? Well, here's just a sort of humorous take on this. Here's a baby being cuddled by a little girl, maybe his or her sister, and here's the baby boy equivalent or the toddler boy equivalent. So it could be something to do with the fact that women are more motivated by love and connection while men are more concerned with competition and aggression. Um, but there are many other reasons or potential reasons why this is the case, but this may be just a little humorous look at why this might be. So in terms of health span, sort of how healthy we are living, uh, how long we are living healthily, this is a diagram of uh, people, the percentage of people in England with one or more health conditions. And you can see that um, among the over 65s, it was 79.3% uh, in 2015. In 2025, the equivalent figure was 84%. And the projection to 2035 is 85.5%. So to quote the authors of this study, over the next 20 years, there'll be an expansion of morbidity, particularly complex multimorbidity. Life expectancy gains will be spent mostly with four plus diseases. So you can imagine why most people do not want to live to a great old age, because it will not be a great old age. It will be a very miserable old age. This leads to the question, is there a chronic disease guarantee? Are we like some sort of car that will gradually deteriorate and get worse and worse and worse until eventually we reach a point where we're scrapped? Well, it would seem the answer is yes. If you look at this chart of chronic conditions in people aged 65 or over in England from 2015 data, um, then you look at these diseases and there's massive incidences of, of them all, uh, notably hypertension and arthritis. If you add up all the percentages in the columns, they add up to way more than 100. So that illustrates what I showed you previously about multi-morbidities. However, I would argue that there doesn't have to be a chronic disease. It doesn't have to be this way. And it's an assumption that it's an inevitable part of aging, but it's not necessarily so. 
In fact, I would go I would go as far as to say most chronic conditions are preventable, treatable, and even reversible through lifestyle changes. They are the reasons why most people get chronic diseases, and then the reasons why they can be changed. And it gives people a great deal of power when people know that. So, what is the cause of chronic disease? Well, I deliberately put cause rather than causes. Well, I think it all boils down to, or mostly boils down to, one thing. And that one thing is stress. And most people, when they hear the word stress, they think about um, psychological or psychosocial stress. But I would argue that stress is bigger than that. It's uh, physical, chemical, and psychological and psychosocial issues that cause the body to break down in some way. And you can boil it down to either too much of certain things, too little of certain things, or something that's too new, something that the body's not used to on an evolutionary basis, something the body's not accustomed to that it can't really process. So if you think about stress as being physical, chemical and psychosocial, you can imagine that the body is being constantly subjected to stresses, for example air and water pollutants, potentially stressful events, processed foods, electromagnetic radiation, etc, etc. But the body has mechanisms to deal with stress and toxins, so it's not a question of just being subject to them, it's a question of how you deal with them. And the capacity of the body to heat, deal with stresses or toxins can be compared with a bucket. As long as there's capacity in the bucket, the body does not become diseased, but if there's more stress or toxicity than the bucket can hold, a disease will emerge. So a disease emerges once the threshold is crossed. And this threshold can be clear-cut or gradual. So this introduces the idea of a disease state occurring when the threshold is crossed, and that's just the uh, threshold theory of disease. So here's cumulative stress against physiological state. You can have things like your um, blood sugar levels can be a physiological state, uh, your fat in circulation, blood circulation, fat or cholesterol, triglycerides or cholesterol in circulation can be a physiological state. Um, the state of your kidney health can be a physiological state, etc. So at this moment, we see in the slide, the uh, stresses are below the top of the bucket, so um, no disease state has been manifested. But if things continue along these, the trajectory they, they're on at the moment, the disease threshold can be crossed and then disease manifests itself. It could be something like diabetes uh, with excess of blood sugar. And if that process continues, then you'll get multimorbidities. So you'll get an example of where you've got diabetes, you might have heart disease, you might have kidney failure. And chronic disease symptoms manifest themselves when stress exceeds the disease threshold. So put in another way, chronic disease equals an overflowing stress bucket. And the stress bucket is not a static concept. The size of the stress bucket can change and very often does over the course of people's lives. Notably, it's relatively small when you're a newborn infant and you're vulnerable to a whole host of diseases. It increases as you go through life, maximizing at about uh, in your early mid twenties, decreases as you start to age, as you get into your forties and fifties and dramatically deteriorates into old age in your sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, and now hundreds. And you often find that people as they age, are unable to tolerate the things they used to tolerate. I'm not just talking about, um, young people and uh, all these modern newfangled inventions and this kind of thing, but uh, physio physiological processes. So for example, it might be your laundry detergent, it might be the perfume you're using, it might be something that you're eating, it could be something in the environment, it could be mold, it could be a pesticide or something like that, it could be noise, there are various things. And this introduces the concept of your bucket size changing and these thresholds essentially going down over time. So you're subjected to the same stresses. But in this case, the disease threshold goes down rather than the stress is going up and the disease threshold is crossed in the same way. And this shows a uh, all or nothing model, but as I said before, um, disease can creep up gradually as well. So you can get things like pre-diabetes uh, preceding di full-blown diabetes. And those can be thought of as the canaries in the coal mine. So it's really important to take heed of these canaries. If you're getting sudden aches and pains, you're getting certain symptoms, you're getting certain allergies, this kind of thing, which are not bothering you that much, it's important to heed these warnings because they're trying to tell you something. But as well as stress, it's very important to think about the concept of resilience. Resilience is essentially the size of your bucket and the ability to handle stress of all kinds. 
I've used this illustration of a forest. This is following a hurricane that swept through this particular forest. And there's one little tree that's still got all its green leaves, one little shrub. Um, it shows that it's resilient. But also, if you look at the trees behind, they're also resilient. They're still standing and they will regreen. They will gain their foliage. So we can get knocked about. We can get buffeted by life's events and all these various stresses, but we can bounce back. And I think it's really important to emphasize this resilience because it leaves us in a state where we can become more empowered when it comes to disease management and preventing and reversing and uh, arresting diseases. So as I mentioned, resilience is the ability to handle stress of all kinds. And this is essentially a balance between the size of the stress bucket and the total stress load or body burden. So in a nutshell, the cause of chronic disease is an overflowing stress bucket. And by inference, the solution to chronic disease is to maximize resilience. So how do we maximize resilience, I hear you ask? And here's the answer. Maximize resilience by addressing the seven pillars of a healthy lifestyle. And these seven pillars are eating a whole food, plant-rich diet, proper hydration, sound sleep, effective breathing, maximizing psych psychosocial health, frequent movement, and a healthy environment, creating a healthy environment. And this talk shall focus mainly on the nutritional piece of the jigsaw, which I think is foundational. So for the remainder of this presentation, I want to concentrate on eating naturally, eating a whole food plant-rich diet, and what this can do for our health. Well, we put about a ton of food and drink in our life, every, in our body every year. So it's astonishing that many people think it doesn't affect all aspects of our health. And we're talking about eating naturally, we're talking about eating a mainly plant-based diet, or as I call it, a plant-rich diet. Um, it does not necessarily have to be exclusively vegan. I myself am a vegan, my wife's a vegan, and we believe it's a very healthy choice. Um, but the evidence seems to say that uh, a diet that emphasizes plants above all else is the healthiest diet to have and a little bit of animal product will not hugely detract from that. Here's a chart of the leading UK disease risk factors. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them from tobacco smoking at the top to lead exposure at the bottom. And the disability adjusted life years as a percentage in terms of the number of years in which you'll live with a disability or a chronic disease due to that contributing factor. And there's a whole list of chronic and uh, infectious diseases and other causes of death in there. If you look at which of those ones, those diseases are due in part to a dietary effect, a dietary related, you'll find that 14 of the 20 risk factors are diet related and that constitutes 67% of the risk. So two thirds of the risks are diet related. And if you exclude tobacco smoking, which are obviously very, very unhealthy, and if you're doing it, don't do it. Uh, if you include tobacco smoking, then the risk rises to over 80%. So it's a massive, massive factor, and it can't be understated, and it often is. So what is Britain's bad diet? Well, here's the poster child for Britain's bad diet. They're indulging in a bit of ice cream eating and looking very, very happy with the situation. It stands for British average diet, bad, not Boris's atrocious diet or Boris's awful diet and can lead to many symptoms such as someone who's out of shape, has poor recall and unearned self-confidence. So the official dietary guidance in England comes from the Eat Well Guide published by Public Health England in 2018. And although it's not perfect, it's certainly the case that if most people were eating according to the official guidance, they'd be a lot healthier than they are now. This is a summary, as you can see, fruit and vegetables should make up about a third of the food we eat each day. Starchy carbohydrates are a very important part of our diet. Dairy and alternatives, so I've certainly posted a lot of things on the internet about why I don't think dairy is a healthy choice. It's in there, but certainly at least they've got alternatives. Beans, pulses, fish, egg, meat and other proteins. Again, they put animal sources, they also put vegetable sources, which I think is very good. Uh, they got treats on the side. Um, which you should limit the amounts of and also put water six to eight glasses a day Put oils and spreads you can do without oils and spreads uh, in your diet Which most people don't think you can but you certainly can uh, eat oil free But it's a very minor portion they put in there and they say choose unsaturated oils and use small amounts. So I think that's good advice 
So how well did the English comply with the dietary guidelines? We can take various criteria such as energy intake, the five a day recommendation and the recommendation regarding ultra processed food and look at how um, things have panned out. Here we can see energy intake in calories among males and females and you can see at all stages of life there's a surplus of calories consumed over the calories required and that surplus is higher among males than among females. And that could be back to what we were saying earlier one of the reasons why women live longer than men. The men are simply eating more than women or eating more excess than women because all groups are eating excess. If you look at the curve of overweight or obesity for men it rises steadily up to about the age of 16 to 18 then inflects about the age of 16 to 18 and goes up again and there's an inflection again about in the 31 to 60 group where it kind of levels off. That's not necessarily a good thing because some people could be wasting away due to chronic diseases so actually that might be a give a falsely optimistic picture. If you look at the equivalent for women the rise is a bit more steady so there's not these big inflection points. The rise from about 16 to 18 in men could be because they're not doing school sports anymore. Women's activity rates maybe they're not as great in their youth as men's but they're more steady throughout their life. And it's kind of accepted that gaining weight is a normal function of aging or it certainly doesn't have to be this way. So looking at the fruit and vegetable recommendation, the recommendation for five a day, so what percentage of 11 to 18 year olds meet the five a day recommendation? Well the percentage is from roll 8. So how are the 19 to 64 year olds doing in terms of the recommendation? Well they're doing slightly better than the younger population, the 27%. And what about the oldies, the over 65s? Well they reach 35%. So it's the oldies who do the best, relatively speaking, but it's only relatively speaking because it's not doing great. You're talking about the 35% as opposed to a 27% and 8%. So they're on the podium there, but they're not doing a fantastic job. We look at the phenomenon of the modern era, which is ultra processed food. And here's a picture from The Guardian of some of the UK's best selling ultra processed foods. And you can see that it's the sort of stuff that's mass produced in a factory with cheap ingredients. It's attractively packaged and heavily marketed and has a very, very high profit margin and it practically never spoils. The question is what percentage of our calories in the UK this is comes from ultra processed food? And the percentage is a whopping 50.7%. So we can consider the fact that we are essentially powered by edible food-like substances in the world, of, in the words of Michael Pollan, the food writer, um, in his excellent book, Food Rules, talks about the idea of edible food-like substances, not even real food. You look at this pie chart here, and you think about the percentage of, of ultra-processed food is about 50.7 50 or 51%. It doesn't mean the remainder of the diet is healthy. We're talking about processed foods as well, and processed culinary ingredients could be including things like sugar. We've only got minimally processed or unprocessed ingredients, 29%. So the figures are really, really dire in Britain. And unfortunately, Britain leads a particular league table when it comes to Europeans of eating ultra processed food. So it's not a, uh, something to be proud of that UK tops the charts at 50.7. And you can see how much less ultra processed food is eaten as you're going south in Europe, as you're going towards the Mediterranean countries with countries like Greece, only 13.7%, Portugal 10.2%, and interestingly enough Malta has 27.6% and Malta is highly influenced by British heritage. So what does eating naturally actually mean? Well, I love this dietary manifesto in eight words by Michael Pollan, the author of Food Rules and Eater's Manual. He says, eat real foods, not too much, mostly plants. It's actually a seven word manifesto in the book. It says, he says, eat, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, but he distinguishes food and edible food like substances. So I think for the sake of clarity and sake of simplicity, I put eat real food to make that distinction. His very short book of 64 food rules includes things like eat only foods that will eventually rot. Stop eating before you're full. It came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. If a third grader can, can't pronounce the names of the ingredients, don't eat it. If it has a TV commercial, don't eat it. Don't buy your fuel where you get your fuel. 
And last, but by no means least, break the rules once in a while. So eating naturally to me and to many others uh, is eating a whole food plant rich diet. As I mentioned, this doesn't necessarily have to be a pure vegan diet. So here's the new Paradigm Health whole food plant rich food plate. It comprises of 30 to 50% non starchy vegetables. So kales, cabbage, broccoli, spinach, squash, that kind of thing. Peppers, onions, garlics, carrots, lettuce, cucumbers, tomatoes, etc. Starchy vegetables, such as whole wheat, brown rice, quinoa, potatoes, sweet potatoes. Fruits, berries, apples, oranges, peaches, grapes, pears, etc. Legumes, such as kidney beans, black beans, chickpeas, peas, lentils, soybeans, peanuts. Nuts and seeds such as chia seeds, flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, walnuts and cashews. And then there's a group of things that should be limited such as alcohol, eggs, dairy, red meat, poultry, fish, oil, sugar and processed foods. And things that should be avoided altogether, processed meat which is our carcinogen, non-organic animal products, GMO foods, non-organic brow foods, that's barley, rye, oats and wheat and allergenic foods. That will vary from person to person depending on their individual physiology. Two to four litres of water equivalent, that includes uh, what you're taking in your food. So you may be taking half a litre or even up to a litre if you're taking a lot of green uh, vegetables in your food. And finally, don't beat yourself up over an occasional indiscretion. That's back to Michael Pollan's uh, food rule, break the rules once in a while. So here's just a few examples of the kind of food that myself and Julie eat in our everyday life. That's a typical breakfast for us, oats, fruits and, fl and flax seeds. Soup is very much a stable, staple and here's some of the ingredients. You can just whiz it up in a blender, cook it in a pressure cooker for 10, 12, 15 minutes and you're pretty much done. Very, very simple, very, very healthy and very, very delicious. Vegetable paella with salad. Nearly everything we have is with salad. Bulgar wheat stir fry. Meze cake, roast potatoes, and that's done with a very minimal amount of oil, maybe about one tablespoon of oil for a large serving for four or five people. You really can get away with cooking with a lot less oil than you may think. Creamy mushroom risotto, absolutely delicious. Cottage pie. Vegetable curry and mushroom and leek pies. So there's a lot to choose from you, only limited by your own creativity. Um, and nowadays there's so many recipes online that you're actually not even limited by your own personal creativity. You can get what you pretty much what you want online. There's so much that can be done nowadays. So what is the evidence for the health advantages from a whole food plant rich diet? I'll present uh, two strands of evidence, the role of a whole food plant rich diet in preventing, arresting and reversing diseases and what the blue zones tell us, those are the uh, parts of the world where people live the longest and healthiest lives. So a whole food plant rich diet can help prevent, arrest or reverse disease and here's a list of some of the diseases where it's been shown to be of value, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, kidney disease, cancer, chronic liver diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, mood disorders, influenza and pneumonia and blood infections and there are many more. So if we take a timeline, these are the timelines of the first dates I could discover when uh, there's been compelling scientific evidence for the claim that a whole food plant rich diet can play an important role in preventing, arresting and reversing common chronic diseases. 1926 in cardio for cardiovascular disease and yet it's still not given as mainstream advice. 1935 for diabetes and again it's not given as mainstream advice to eat a whole food plant rich diet. 1950 for multiple sclerosis through the very successful work of Royce Swank. 1955 for kidney disease. 1975 for cancer and I'll be talking about this in a little bit more detail. 1977 chronic liver disease. 1981 rheumatoid arthritis, 1993 Alzheimer's disease, 2001 Parkinson's disease, 2009 mood disorders and COPD, 
2010. 2011, influenza and pneumonia. And 2012, blood infections. In particular, I'll focus on cardiovascular disease, cancer and diabetes, which three are major killers. There's been a great deal of work on the effects of diet on cardiovascular disease and success, very successful dietary interventions. This particular study by Cogro Esselstyn et al. in 2014 documents 198 cardiovascular disease patients receiving counselling to convert from their usual diet to a whole food plant-based diet. There was 89% compliance and of those who complied the major cardiac events totaled one stroke. And these were pretty sick people before they came for this to participate in this trial. 13 of the 21 non-compliant participants experienced adverse events. That's a 63% recurrence. That's a hundred times the difference, a hundredfold difference between those who complied and those who did not comply. The photograph is of blood flow through a coronary artery, the left anterior descending artery known as the Widowmaker. The left anterior descending supplies the entire front wall of the heart and much of the side wall. The images of the LAD of Joe Crow, a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, who had a heart attack in 1996. The lower one third of the LAD artery is completely moth eaten in the first photograph. Following a consultation with Coral Esselstyn, Crow adopted the recommended diet, which was essentially a diet that eliminated dairy, fish, and meat, and added oils. And according to Esselstyn, he became the personification of plant based perfection. Here's the second photo, you can see the difference. His recovery involved no drugs or surgery. This was a multi-country study, a study from 39 countries of animal fat intake and breast cancer, diet and breast cancer. And you can see the rate, uh, the higher the animal fat intake in terms of grams per day, the higher the rate of breast cancer. And that's got an R squared or an explanatory power of 81%. So that's a very, very powerful correlation. You virtually never see these in real world situations because of so many other factors. So an obvious question is, is it animal fat or is it just fat in general? Well, if you do the same analysis on plant fat and breast cancer, you get no correlation whatsoever. There's no pattern, there's just a snowstorm of dots. But it may not be animal fat per se, it might just be animal products because animal fat is 94% correlated with animal protein. So you can't really dissect or tease out the individual factors but it could be just the consumption of animals itself which is the factor responsible for the increase in breast cancer levels. Another major killer and a cause of illness is type 2 diabetes which is becoming an epidemic in the developed world. This is the AH2 or Adventist Health Study 2 prevalence of type 2 diabetes in a health conscious group. So this group was generally fit and healthy compared with the average population. This is the Seventh-day Adventist and part of their credo is to worship God through being health, healthy physically and mentally as well. So they're generally a healthy group. They tend to diverge in terms of their dietary choices. Their doctrine says they should be mainly vegetarian, some are not. So you've got a natural experiment. You've got some are omnivores, some are semi-vegetarian, some are pesco-vegetarians, i.e. they eat a bit of fish. Some are lacto-ovo, they eat a bit of uh, fish and eggs and dairy. And some are pure vegan. Looking at this in terms of type 2 diabetes incidence in adults over 30, you can see the omnivores are the highest, followed by the semi-vegetarians, followed by the pesco-vegetarians, followed by the lacto-ovo, and followed by the vegans, who are the lowest total on 2.9%. So a diet that included at least weekly meat intake was associated with a 74% in odds of developing diabetes compared with a zero meat intake. But it's worth noting that the non-vegans in the cohort ate meat and poultry relatively infrequently. So it suggests that even small increases in red meat and poultry consumption disproportionately increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. The second line of evidence I'd like to show you is what the blue zones tell us. And I said before, the blue zones are the locations in the world where people live the longest and healthiest lives. They were discovered by various researchers and have been written up as a book by Dan Bootner. The book Blue Zones, well worth a read. So what do these longest living people have in common? Well, here's some information from three of the blue zones. Loma Linda, California, Sardinia, Italy, and Okinawa, Japan. And you can see some of the factors they have in common. 
they're strongly family oriented. They often live with their older relatives and then live with the younger relatives and uh, have very close family bonds. None of them smoke. They all have plant-based diets. They have constant moderate physical activity. A lot of social engagement and they eat a lot of legumes. They like their beans. And here's a physical personification of this lifestyle. This is a hundred year old plus uh, gentleman from Okinawa, Japan, looking in superb physical condition. Look at that, look at that torso. I think uh, we would agree he looks a picture of good health. So if a whole food plant rich diet is so effective, why doesn't everyone promote it? I've singled out three reasons, vested interests or conflicts of interest, contradictory study findings and lack of awareness. But in the main, you can put it down to the old adage, follow the money. Here's an illustration of a conflict of interest. In this case, it's the British Nutrition Foundation. Their purpose is to make nutrition science accessible to all. And we do this through the interpretation, translation and communication of often complex scientific information. It sounds good. In all aspects of our work, we aim to generate and communicate clear, accurate, accessible information on nutrition, diet life, and lifestyle, which is impartial, my emphasis and underlining, and relevant to the needs of diverse audiences. However, it's very difficult to be impartial when your governors include representatives of Kellogg's, famous for their nutritional offerings such as Fruit Loops and Pringles. Nestle whose healthy foods include Kit Kat, Quality Street and Nesquik. And PepsiCo, whose health giving ingredients include Doritos, Walker's Crisps and of course Pepsi Cola itself. There are also examples of contradictory study findings and the example that I'll give here is that of eggs and cholesterol. Industry funded research has essentially taken the playbook from the tobacco industry and their product is essentially confusion. So there's plenty of science available for hire and you can pretty much get the results you're, that will so cause doubt in the minds of the public and be taken up by the media who are fed stories by the companies. This slide shows an article from the Guardian saying eggs are no longer considered a health hazard. In fact, they're incredibly good for you. So how many should you eat? The evidence behind it is very scanty to say the least, and there's plenty of evidence to the contrary. So it all comes down to this big debate over dietary cholesterol. And it was a debate that was thought to be resolved um, over 20 years ago, where we're looking at cholesterol levels in the blood and relative risk of a heart attack, and it goes up as, you, as uh, cholesterol levels go up in the blood. This is total cholesterol, by the way, and you can divide it into LDL, HDL, and various other to cholesterol components and dietary cholesterol does contribute to blood cholesterol and if you contribute in a different way depending on your baseline cholesterol but it nonetheless does contribute if you've uh, got a baseline dietary cholesterol is very very low then more added dietary cholesterol will contribute more if you've got a baseline cholesterol that's high dietary cholesterol will contribute less as an increment so among other factors, the degree to which dietary cholesterol affects blood cholesterol is dependent on existing cholesterol levels in the blood. It's analogous to adding three cigarettes a day to two separate groups. The first group is non-smokers and the second group is those who smoke, already smoke 20 a day. The effect of the additional three cigarettes will be much greater for the non-smokers. So the overall conclusion was essentially the case was closed. So you should minimize dietary cholesterol as a contribution to longevity and good health. And as a consequence, there are very few studies of dietary cholesterol on dietary cholesterol from 2000. So the lack of studies since 2000 can be attributed mainly to the fact that the science overwhelmingly supported the fact that dietary cholesterol was a health risk. However, industry studies stepped into this vacuum. And that provides the context for a 13, 2013 review of studies, which only took into account those published since 2000, which took into account various interventions, um, 12 studies in total, you look at the interventions, it's mostly eggs. It can also be eggs, saturated fat and calories, uh, prawns, which are kind of high in cholesterol, eggs and low carb diet and eggs and exercise. But look at this last column, funding sources. 
of the 12 references cited, only one is funded by non industry and non industry body. Ten are funded by the egg industry, one's funded by a fisheries related interest group. Based on these very conflicted studies, the authors of the 2013 review concluded that the effect of dietary cholesterol on LDL cholesterol concentration, that's the so called bad cholesterol, is modest and appears to be limited to population subgroups. And their conclusion was in these cases, restrictions in dietary cholesterol intake are likely warranted. So, nowhere were they saying that these cholesterol laden foods are healthy. It was a weak conclusion based on very, very partial data, but nonetheless, they didn't recommend you increase your consumption of eggs, and that was the message that got into the popular press. Here's a 2007 review of studies on health effects of soft drinks, juice, and milk and the relationship between funding sources and conclusion among nutrition-related nutrition -related science articles. They found that studies supported by the food industry are four to eight times more likely to support conclusions favourable to the industry. Industry funding of nutrition-related scientific articles may bias conclusions in favour of the sponsors' products with potentially significant implications for public health. Similar conclusions were drawn by a 2013 review of non-nutritive sweeteners, a review and update. There are mixed reports about the safety of aspartame. All of the studies funded by industry vouch for its safety, whereas 92% of independently funded studies report that aspartame can cause adverse health effects. So you can see that there are huge disparities, so you really, really need to look at the small print and see where the, who was paying for the study before you can really vouch for its veracity. Lack of awareness. A lack of awareness of the power of nutrition extends across all groups, including the so-called experts. This is exemplified by medical training, which nutrition is not exactly a priority. So I pose the question, how many days of nutritional education do medical students receive in the UK? Well, according to a study of, by Chung et al. in, um, in 2014, the average for UK medical students was three days. Just three days of tuition in nutrition. That's out of a total of 750 days of contact time. So medical students do have a very, very intense course, but nutrition is not the priority. That gives you a percentage of just 0.4%. When you consider that the source of chronic diseases might be two thirds to maybe 80% of chronic diseases are caused by poor nutrition, then that's nothing short of criminal. So where is the solution to chronic disease? Well, According to mainstream commentators, there's a continual promise of a magic bullet that will solve this or that chronic disease. This process of development will be rolled out soon. It's just around the corner. But actually, we already have the solution to a huge range of the chronic diseases that afflict people today. The solution is the adoption of a healthy lifestyle through which the majority of chronic diseases that have blighted industrialized societies today can be prevented, arrested, and reversed. The system that Julie and I have developed and which we teach at intensive workshop is centered around the seven pillars of healthy lifestyle. Whole food, plant-rich diet, proper hydration, sound sleep, effective breathing, managing psychosocial health, frequent movement, and a healthy environment, creating a healthy environment. Our two-day workshop, How to Optimise Body-Mind Health, will go in much more detail into all of this, where we look at people's health journeys, where they are now and where they'd like to be, 12 principles of good health, the seven pillars of healthy lifestyle as have been introduced here, and together with the participants develop personalised programmes for their lifelong good health. So it'd be great to see you along there at the workshop, future workshop dates to be announced on our website. Thank you for listening, and if you like what you heard, give us the old thumbs up, share widely, and subscribe. See you next time. Bye.